In 1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuler, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Schuler will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Turn around to those who are standing near you. Greet them warmly in the name of the Lord and say, God loves you and so do I. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have called us to this place. It's such an honor to be here to give glory to the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that everything we do would glorify you. We pray for those of us who are here this morning that you would lift us up, encourage us. We pray, Lord, that we would draw closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
In preparation for the message this morning, hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. This is the word of the Lord.
We're so excited to have uh, Grammy-nominated musician Jenny Oaks Baker back here today at Shepherd's Grove and the Hour of Power. Jenny began her music career uh, at the young age of four, uh, winning several competition awards during her youth. She earned her bachelor's degree at Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia and her master's degree at none other than Juilliard. That's awesome. She's performed with the Utah Symphony, the Concerto Soloist Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia, and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Wow. So today Jenny is here to perform with her four children, Hannah, Laura, Matthew, and Sarah. Let's give her a hand and welcome her. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. What are you working on now, Jenny? Um, well, I, my husband and I have four children, so I spend a lot of time being a mother, and I perform around the, the world and the country, and um, right now I'm making a lot of music videos, okay. which are on my YouTube channel, and that enables me to be able to perform for millions and yet be home with my family more. And you've got lots of views. I've seen some of those uh, videos. It seems like you're really breaking through. And now your yeah. faith is a big part of, of what you do, isn't it? It is. It's huge. I'm so grateful for my faith in Jesus Christ and the direction and the purpose it gives to my life and the lives of my family. That's great, Jenny. And how can we get your music if people want to listen to you more? Um, my YouTube channel has the videos. Uh, my website, JennyOaksBaker.com, and Amazon and iTunes. So, well, thank you, Jenny. We're so glad that you're here today. We're yeah, so, so grateful to, to have here. you worshiping with us and to hear your family. Let's give them a yeah. hand, the Baker family. Thank you.
Pastor Bobby is passionate about being and helping you to be a happy and whole student of Jesus. Each week before his teaching, he encourages everyone to recite a confession statement as a way of opening up their hearts to God. Today, Pastor Bobby wants to send you an accent pillow with the words from the weekly confession, I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. Memorize and pray through these statements and watch your life change. For your gift of $25, we will send you this 9.5 by 11 inch cotton canvas decorative pillow. Call, write, or go online today. Thank you. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we.
Wow, thank you, Jenny Oaks Baker. That was amazing. We're so grateful for your gift. <laughs> Friends, we're so glad you are here today. We believe that you are here for a reason. Nobody is here on accident. Nobody on watching on television is watching on accident. So many times I get tweets or emails from people who say, I was flipping the channel and you said something and I felt like it was God speaking to me. We believe, we're reformed, we don't think that things happen on accident. We believe that God planned you to be here. And with that spirit, I pray that you approach today with a sense of openness to hear from God today. If you're watching on TV, come to Shepherd's Grove. We want to meet you. We want to give you a big hug. We want to worship with you. We want you to celebrate with us. So we're here every single Sunday from 9.30 and 11.15. We're just a bike ride from Disneyland. So if you're ever in the L.A. Orange County area, please come and worship with us. We want to meet you. Also, for those of you who are here today, very often in church, you're not allowed to pull your phone out. This is a very phone-friendly church. So if you have your phone and you want to take pictures and you want to Instagram, if you want to tweet the service, do it. For those of you watching on TV too, please tweet. I mean, very often I'm watching with you at home on Saturday night or other times during the week. And if you live tweet the service, I'll reply to everybody at least once. So it's at Bobby Schuler is my Twitter handle. Our hashtag is Hour of Power. Also, I wanted to say, uh, give a warm welcome to my parents, Robert and Donna Schuler, who are here today, and my grandma, Linnell. So glad you're here. So, Dad, we love you. And, and I, I grew up, what's really cool is this pulpit is a, you know, repainted version of the pulpit my dad used to preach from at Rancho Capistrano. It's one of the reasons we keep it up here, even though it doesn't necessarily fit the decor. There's a sentimentality to this pulpit for me. So it's my dad's pulpit. So I love preaching from it. He's one of the greatest preachers in the world, one of my favorite preachers. I'm so happy to have him here. All right, you know what we do next? Stand with me. We're going to say this declaration together. You hold your hands out like this. This is a sign of receiving. Like this. I know. It doesn't make you Pentecostal. Don't worry. It's okay. <laughs> All right, say it with me. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Amen. You may be seated. Those words come from a mix of Henry Nowen and Dallas Willard. If you ever want to read a good spiritual book, start with those guys. They'll, they'll put you in the right direction. Today, uh, we want to talk about the triumphal entry. We're continuing, actually, a series, Follow the Rabbi, in which we're wanting to understand the context of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We want to understand the culture that uh, people in Jesus' day were living in. What we're doing is studying what it means to read the Bible in its context as a first century Near Eastern Jewish man or woman. They would read the Bible very differently and it would actually be the right way. So the closer we get to the way they read, the closer we get to the intent of the author. And I just want to say too, that in about 10 minutes, I'm going to ask like 20 volunteers, and you're going to have to stand, so if you're not you know, quick on your feet, then don't volunteer. I'm going to ask like 20, 30 volunteers to come for the purpose of storytelling. I'm, I'm hoping you do this for me. Okay, so think. Would that be me? Okay, so do it. All right. Uh, in the triumphal entry, um, there, is a, there is, I think, a hidden or not so hidden message that essentially says this. Very often, as religious people, as Christians, as disciples, we want Jesus to be our Savior. Meaning we want him to get us into heaven. We want him to heal us or help us with our circumstances. We want him to be our savior. But we don't want him to be our Lord. Meaning we don't want to obey what he taught us. We want to make excuses for why we don't actually have to do what he said. And this is very, very common for theologians, churches, to frame Jesus as savior, but not as Lord. Or to make Lord more about being God, and he is God, and less about being master. In other words... I do what he tells me to do. Remember, Jesus was a rabbi, 
And the things that rabbis care most about is that their students, their Talmudim, do what they said to do. And so every human being struggles with a few things at least as disciples that Jesus tells us to do. Loving our enemies is probably one of the most popular. And so very often we make excuses about why we don't have to do some of the things that Jesus tells us to do. Because usually those are the hardest ones. So today's sermon is really going to be about self-evaluation and examining your own heart. Very often for us as churchgoers and church folk, when we hear a sermon, especially if it's a toe-stepping sermon, you know, we go, oh, Joe needs to hear that sermon. (laughs) My mom, my kids, right? My roommate needs to hear that sermon. You need to hear this sermon. (laughs) Resist the temptation to make this about somebody else. Make this about you. It's really hard. You have built into your subconscious defense mechanisms to keep you from really examining uh, your heart and your mind and your life. Let's set the stage before we get into the triumphal entry. 200 years before Jesus, there was a famous Jewish warrior general named Judas Maccabeus. Judah Maccabee. Uh, Judas Maccabeus was a Kohen meaning he was from the priestly family. And he, he was the son of a priest. Uh, and he rose to power when Israel was under the oppressive thumb of the Seleucid Empire. The Seleucid Empire is one of the four leftovers from the Macedonian Alexander the Great Greek Empire. And these Seleucids, or these Greeks, uh, came into Israel... And they defiled the temple. They offered swine flesh on the altar. Remember, this is a Jewish temple. The most unkosher, horrible thing you can do. Swine flesh on the altar. They turned the altar into an altar for Zeus. And they turned the temple barracks uh, into a brothel. And they filled the temple with all sorts of pagan memorabilia and symbolism. And, of course, this has the oppressed and occupied Jewish nationals uh, in a fit of anger. And up comes this William Wallace kind of character that really was a good man and really is a hero, Judas Maccabeus. It was like 160 B.C. And Judas rises up, raises an army as a general, and kicks the Greeks out of Israel. Yay! Right, everybody's excited about that. And when he enters into Jerusalem, you got to listen. They take palm fronds and they lay them down for him and Shimon Maccabeus. And they come into Jerusalem and they go into the temple and they clear out all the pagan stuff. And to, to commemorate the cleansing of the temple, the holiday Hanukkah is, is established. Now fast forward 200 years, because it's 30 AD probably, 30-something. And now the Greeks are gone, but who's there? Who else is there? Rome, right? Rome was evil. I don't know why in the West we think of the Roman Empire as this kind of like, you know, pragmatic, sort of noble, good thing that, Rome was evil. They engaged in Holocaust. Uh, they engaged, they tortured people. They murdered people. They killed Christians left and right. Um, they were immoral. They, were, they would uh, kill children. They would kill old people. They would kill sick people. Uh, they were ruthless. They were the epitome of all of the evils you can think of in empire. And now here's a just people, the Jewish people who love God and have a completely different way of living and they're under the oppression of Rome. Are you you following me? And Rome occupies Israel and everyone in Israel wants Rome out. Everyone wants them gone. But there's nothing they can do about it. Now I want you to picture what's happening 
on the day that Jesus comes in. It's the week of Passover. Everybody say Passover. The reason that's a big deal. Some historians estimate that in a city that normally had 200,000 people, Jerusalem, it has two to two and a half million people in the city. All of them Jewish. All of them deeply religious and committed to the faith. Because they've traveled from all, all over in the Near East to just come to Jerusalem for this celebration. Many of them are young, fiery, zealous Jews. Are you following me? Um, there are a lot of people in Jerusalem. It is like Times Square on New Year's Eve. You, can't, you follow me? It is a big, big deal. This is also a big Money maker for those who are in, you know, religious business. Uh, the two that you hear about in this passage are the money changers. When you go to the temple, you're not allowed to bring in unkosher money. So imagine like you have your Roman coins and you have to exchange it for Jewish shekels. Only Jewish money gets to be in the temple. And so what happens? You exchange it, what do they do? They're just going to take a little bit off the top in the exchange. All that money goes to the priests and the temple treasury. So the, the religious institution is, gets fat and rich off of, off of this experience. So poor pilgrims who have already spent a lot to come to Israel, are, they're now taking a slice of the pie. And then if you want to offer a dove, or a dove is the animal mentioned here, a dove outside of the temple was something like four pence, but inside the temple it was 75 pence. And you have to buy it in the temple. And so the religious institution is skewering uh, religious pilgrims, poor, many of them poor people. Okay, so Antonia Fortress was a, a big castle that was built under the northern wall of the temple and it was about twice the height of the temple courts. And that was where the Roman garrison was. And so when you went to the temple, you'd see this huge Roman castle with Roman archers and Roman spearmen. And what was that? That was the symbol of Rome saying, you may have your temple, but we're watching you. We are watching you. And one foul move, we will crush you with extreme prejudice. So over this temple looms this imperial Roman evil machine that, you know, is just waiting for one wrong move to just crush Israel. That's the stage. Okay? The Jews, they want Rome out. Now, think of Jesus. Jesus has now become hugely popular. His ministry has traveled all over. Everybody knows about him. People are hearing about him raising Lazarus from the dead and all these miracles that he's doing. Some people are saying he's the Messiah. And everyone now, and this is the thing you have to hear about this text, everyone now, when they think of who the Messiah is, they're thinking Judas Maccabeus. Are you hearing me? They're thinking military general. They're thinking priestly uh, general that will bring a theocracy into Israel. They think Jesus will rise up uh, as a military general and kick these Romans out. When would be a better time than when you got two million young, ambitious Jewish guys in the city? Okay? So Jesus then... He comes in on a donkey, and he comes, we think, through the eastern gate, which is the two prophecies that the Messiah would come in this way. So he, he's essentially telegraphing to the world, on the, you know, coming into Times Square on New Year's Eve, I'm the Messiah you've been waiting for. And what happens? Everybody is freaking out. I mean, it is packed they are barely making a haul because they believe the Messiah has come and everybody thinks today is the day. Today history will be made and what are they shouting? Hosanna. Save now. That's what they're saying. It's, they're, they're hailing Jesus, but they're also saying save now. And what do they want sa salvation from? Rome. Save us from Antonia Fortress. Save us from these Roman pagans. Save us from their evil ways. Save us from all the taxes and all the horrible stuff that they put on us. And Jesus comes in and they're shouting, Hosanna. They're laying their, their uh, robes on the road. And that's a way of saying, like, you're the king. And Jesus comes in on a donkey, which, by the way, you're only supposed to walk in on Passover. So he's just telegraphing. 
that he, and, and what's ha- I always like to picture it this way, and I think what's happening is a, a lane is made so that Jesus' procession will go to Antonia Fortress where Pilate is rather than go to the temple. Now, where are those 20, 30 people that I asked? Would you please stand? I need your help. Come on down, hurry. Oh, my goodness. Nobody? Oh, wait, we got one. I need 20. I've got three, four. This is horrible. Come on, just come on down. And what we're going to do is we're going to make... Yeah, good, okay. We're going to make, like, an aisle here. All right, let's make, like, a... We're going to make, make, like, split it, you know? Like, we're going to... We're telling the story here. So some on this side, some on that side. You're the guys with the palm branches. All right, and we want it to go this way. Go that way. All right? You're going to be at Jesus. You're going to go at the top there. All right? All right. And go, like, open, like a path, you know? Like, like, okay. All right, you got it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so imagine Antonia Fortress is over here. That's where Pilate is in the Romans. And you got to close the gap here. you got to close it, all right? There's the... And what's over here is the temple, okay? Where Dave is taking pictures. All right, right here. So Dave is the temple. And, and so it's like there's a path that's being made for Jesus. Okay, now all of you guys say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Okay, and go ahead and start walking. And say, walking. And it's like there's this pathway. And they want, they want him to go that way. And he goes, excuse me. Do you get it? It's like, wait, where's he going? All right, thanks, that's it. Thanks, you may be seated. They're kind of like, they're kind of like, oh, oh, uh, Jesus, we know this is your first time in Jerusalem. Antonio Fortress is that way. Where are you going? What are you doing? And what does he do? He doesn't go to this fortress. He doesn't go to Rome. He doesn't go to another people. He goes to his own. He goes to his temple. And he gets off his donkey. And everybody's like, what's going on? And he starts to take some bands, and he starts to make a whip together. He's doing it slowly. We were like, what is happening here? And here's this prophet. He's putting this thing together. And all of a sudden, he goes into the, and nobody's ever seen this before. You only see it once, I think, in the scripture. He goes into a rage and begins to kick over tables and chase out the money lenders. I mean, you get this picture of, like, coins being scattered everywhere as money changers and dove sellers are just running for their cowardly lives. And then what happens? And he says, "Uh, my house shall be a house of prayer, right? These are the words of God. And then what happens? A mob of people come into the temple, many of them children. Children are not allowed in. So all of a sudden, everything's changing. All these kids come in, and Jesus just starts healing people. He just starts healing people. Be healed, be healed. You be healed, be healed. And so first he breaks all of the the wretchedness of the temple. He casts all that stuff out. and And it feels violent and angry. But then a shalom peace comes into the midst of it where because that's gone now, now there's a space for prayer and for healing. What is this about? This is about us religious folks. We want God to deal with others, not with us. We want God to deal with our circumstances, not with our heart. We want God to change our environment, not change our soul and our mind. We are resistant. But Jesus says, before I change all the stuff in your life, I want to change you. I want to change you. We want Jesus to be our Savior, but we don't want him to be our Lord. We want him to save us from hell, save us from sickness, save us from poverty, save us from our broken relationships. But we don't want him to mess with our tax collectors and our dove sellers. We don't want him to come into the temple and deal with the really painful, hard difficult stuff in our lives. We make Jesus very often into a projector screen where Jesus simply, the name of Jesus, the idea of Jesus simply becomes whatever we want him to be. 
We're not praying a lot anymore or spending much time with him anymore, so it becomes easy to trick ourselves into thinking Jesus looks kind of like me. No, we, we change the way we view Jesus and we begin to ignore the fact that he asked us to not be angry people and to be honest and to love our enemies and to not do religious things for acclaim and reward. Um, to not give in order to be reconciled, but to store for ourselves treasures in heaven. And to not judge people, and to not shove religion down people's throats. Some of these things, as disciples, we don't want to be his disciples. We just want to be the people on his rescue boat. And you cannot divide those two things. Jesus calls us to do what he said to do. He is not our projector screen, nor can we be entitled to what we think we ought to get when we want to get it. You cannot change Jesus. He can only change you. And the only way that Jesus changes the world and changes the circumstances of our world is by changing its people first. Do you not understand that you may be someone else's circumstance? That they are praying God will change? Let me say that again. Do you not understand that if Jesus changes you, you might be an answer to someone else's prayer? We don't think very often about the way our actions, attitudes, even emotions affect those who live with us and work with us and do life with us. We only think about how we feel. And we don't want Jesus to go there and work on us or change us or make any differences. The whole crux of this story is that we are resistant. We want Jesus to be what we think he's supposed to be. The people thought Jesus would be a military leader, that he'd deal with Rome. They thought he'd save them from Rome. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to save you from yourselves. And that is not often what we want. Save us, Lord. Save us. Save us from my job. Save save me from my, my nasty neighbor. Save my kids, you know, save, save whatever. He said, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you, and not the way you want me to save you. I'm going to save you by changing your heart, if you let me. If you let me. Asking God to save you, but not change you, is like asking a surgeon to, to remove cancer from your body without cutting Cutting and breaking is almost always a part of healing in the kingdom of God. But healing comes after. That's the thing that we see. What's the first thing Jesus does when he comes to the temple? He breaks and then he heals. That's how Jesus deals with our heart. He breaks and he heals. He breaks and he heals. And so we have all this stuff in our life. We have our egos. We have our pride. We have the way we treat people. We have our hurry. We have our worry, our anger, our fear. The things we do with our money that we don't want people to know about. The little 1% of our heart, the little secret sins that we don't want to share with anyone. Our addictions. All the masks that we wear. We have these things and we do our best to make sure that we don't even think about these things, let alone others, so that we can pretend it doesn't need to be dealt with. But sometimes that is the first thing that the Lord will come in to deal. He wants to break your masks, break your ego, break your fear, break your hurry, break your worry, break your shame, break your pride. Sometimes he has to break, he has to cut before he can heal. Will you let him? Or you say, no, just save me from Rome. But the good news is that, and too often we become legalistic on this, the good news is that if, if it's truly Jesus doing the breaking, it'll also be Jesus that does the healing. And here's the other side of that coin. Some of you need healing. You need healing. You need healing from being fired from that job, healing from things your parents or uncles or a teacher said or did to you, from a bully from work or school. Life is hard. It's difficult. Very often, we don't realize that a lot of the ways we treat people, a lot of the ways we think, a lot of the emotions we feel, 
comes from a wound that was never healed. Some of you are praying for forgiveness when you really need to be praying for healing. So after Jesus breaks, he heals. Now let him heal. Let him heal you. You can't be healed unless you acknowledge your wound. The, the deepest, biggest wounds, you know, people that have cancer or people that have some kind of major sickness and ignore it. You know, people actually do that. They're the ones that go the fastest. Ignoring your wounds won't make them go away. It'll make them worse. Simply acknowledging to God, Lord, this is a wound for me. And it is causing me to wound others. Because don't forget, wounded people wound people. Hurt people hurt people. And when those wounds are not healed, uh, you lose the power to be a Jesus kind of person. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, and I'll finish with this one thought. Did you know, historically, that Jesus actually did overthrow Rome? Did you know that? Many historians love to talk about why the greatest empire in human history, the Roman Empire, fell. And there's all sorts of ideas about why it fell, but almost everybody talks about the influx of Christianity. Within a Roman culture that was competitive, uh, that was uh, narcissistic, and that was evil and imperialistic, a culture that uh, just killed people, a new person came, the Christian, the disciple, that said, give us your sick. We want them. Don't kill them. Give us your elderly. Give us your orphans. Did you know orphanages and hospitals emerge out of an early Christianity by taking on all of the Roman citizens that would have been killed? In a Rome that gave you know, all acclaim to those who are powerful, rich, and gifted, Christianity said, no, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the meek, and blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are the sick, and blessed are the hurting, and blessed are the unwanted, and blessed are the black sheep. Give them to us. And what that new heart, that new perspective of human life brought into a Roman world was a whole new culture that began to unravel the Roman Empire. By the time the northerners sacked Rome in the 5th century, it was already weak and crumbling. Do you know why? Because the culture had been completely destroyed by an inbreaking of people with a new heart. Jesus knew how to destroy the Roman Empire. He knew exactly how to destroy it. And it wasn't through military strength. It was by injecting into the Roman Empire a new people with a new heart who loved their enemies, who prayed for those who persecuted them, who didn't live for personal glory but for the glory of God, and who didn't, even for an instant, fear death. That's who undid the Roman Empire. All that to simply say, I believe that if you allow God to deal with the temple, he will use you to deal with Antonia Fortress. Do you hear me? If you allow God to change your heart, to work on you, to go to the most difficult parts of your life, all the stuff that you don't want God to deal with, if you allow him to break you and heal you, he will give you the power to bring down Antonio Fortress. He will bring you the power to deal with your circumstance. Before he deals with your circumstance, he wants to deal with you. Can I get an amen? amen. And that's what this passage is about. The story is that we don't want God to deal with us. We want him to deal with that first. But God is a patient God. First, he wants to deal with you. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment? If you come today and you find yourself emotionally or spiritually at the end of your rope, maybe you've lost your faith, you were a Christian as a kid or a believer or whatever, and, and, and you came today because for whatever reason, your kids were in the thing or you're, Someone dragged you in here. Maybe you're watching on television for the same reason. You're just flipping the channels and something I said or some, something drew you. I want to say to you, I want to give you the opportunity to totally commit your life to Christ. Did you know you don't have to have all the answers? You can become a Christian even though you've never read the Bible. You can be a Christian even if you have no idea what Trinity means. You don't have to have all the faith in the world just a little. That's all he needs. Just the size of a mustard seed. That's all Jesus needs to save you. If you're a 99% doubt and 1% faith, Jesus can use that 1%. And so I want to invite you 
You say, I, I don't know if God exists. I don't know if there's a heaven, but there's a part of me that thinks. And I, I'm willing to give that part of my heart to Jesus and just see what he does with it. And today's your day. And I want to ask you to give your life to Christ. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or stand up or come forward. I'm going to invite the whole church to pray this prayer with me. But if you would pray it with me, um, then when the day comes for your reckoning, when you come before Jesus, you'll remember this day and this prayer, and it will be enough. And I'm going to ask that the Holy Spirit then enters your life and that you begin to be a different kind of person, that you ask Jesus to come into your temple and you, you give yourself the years of time it takes to form you into a sanctified a disciple of Jesus. And so whether that's you or not, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And if it is you, I want you to remember this day the rest of your life. Church, play this prayer with me. Father in heaven, forgive me. I've messed up. I need your help. I ask that you would forgive me. Jesus gave his life on the cross for me. I trust in his resurrection. I believe that he stands by my side. Put me on a new path, Lord. Give me your Holy Spirit. Renew me and restore me, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends, for coming today. I pray that you have an awesome week. Remember, 90% of unchurched people said they would go to church if their friends invited them. I will remind you that nine out of your 10 friends that don't go to church don't go because you haven't invited them. All right? Thank you, everyone, for coming. I pray that you leave feeling refreshed, renewed, and restored. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pastor Bobby is passionate about being and helping you to be a happy and whole student of Jesus. Each week before his teaching, he encourages everyone to recite a confession statement as a way of opening up their hearts to God. Today, Pastor Bobby wants to send you an accent pillow with the words from the weekly confession, I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. 
I am the beloved of God. Memorize and pray through these statements and watch your life change. For your gift of $25, we will send you this 9.5 by 11 inch cotton canvas decorative pillow. Call, write, or go online today. Thank you. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And when you visit our website, you'll discover books, devotionals, and other resources to take your Christian life to a new level. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. And when you do, consider supporting this incredible ministry on a regular monthly basis. We're taking a life-changing message literally around the world and your regular financial support makes all the difference. Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future.